What is up, SVSers, and welcome to another Audiophile Happy Hour. Uh, I believe this is our 58th or 59th. I, I lost count, but uh, who cares? They're all literally awesome. lost count. Yeah. Uh, but welcome, and uh, for anyone who might be here for the first time, uh, this is uh, the Audiophile Happy Hour. We're uh, all members of the SVS team here. I'm joined to my left by uh, Larry McGoor, National Training Manager. How are you, Larry? I am great. Good to see you guys and everybody here online. And of course, just below me, I have our president of SVS, Gary Yakubian. Gary, I see you're not at home. Uh, where are we uh, tuning in from today? I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. Hopefully my hotel Wi-Fi uh, holds up during our show. I'm really happy to... Uh, this is great to have one where we're just having a normal one, where we're not somewhere. Um, so, uh, I, and, and we have a really great guest, so really looking forward to it. And I want to uh, give my warmest greetings to the SVS community. I'm seeing the comments coming fast and furious. I agree. We're going to have quite a bit of travel coming up, which we'll get to in a minute, and uh, we'll be doing some more remote broadcasts, but I agree with you, Gary. It is nice to be doing one from home. Uh, and of course, we have our lead sound expert here, the Wiz with the lightning round Q&A. That would be Mr. Ed Mullen. Ed, how are you? Doing grand, Nick. Doing Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Love so you. Well, excitement from Ed. I know it. He's feeling it. I can tell. Well, uh, you know, you know, I, I wish you do the math of how many, pri how much in prizes we've given away in these because it just, I just did a little thumbnail that it's probably over well over a hundred thousand dollars in prizes. That we've oh, given. we were over a hundred thousand uh, dollars. I think towards the end of last year. Yeah, so the end of last year. Probably pushing yeah. about two hundred k now. But I'll, I'll, I'll do that math for you. We'll figure it out. That's fun. Uh, well, as is the norm, we are going to have four awesome giveaways tonight. All you have to do to be eligible is leave a comment. And like Gary said, I see the comments coming in fast and furious. Uh, you get one entry per comment. Feel free to have conversations, go back and forth with each other. But a million comments does not get you a million entries. Yeah, and, one. Uh, well, you should say to, maybe say, uh, you know, one entry gets you an entry. Excuse me. One comment gets you an entry and 10 comments still you only get one entry. The people just type a comment is always funny, too. Yes, that's that's, okay. that's fine. That, if you're you just as comment, eligible we're as... cool with that. I'd rather I'd rather hear your thoughts because we're. Yes, I miss. Well, I'm getting a lot of. I'm getting outed for missing the one of. Uh, uh, was it last week? You I'll did. Explain. You missed the audio advice live. I'm going to explain good why. Reason. I have a I have a legitimate excuse. Well, but let's I'm save that for the content the slash time. what we've been listening to recently because I think that was a big one and uh, we certainly didn't throw you under the bus during the broadcast. That's for sure. I, I know I deserved uh, it. But, you know, as we were saying, we'll have three awesome giveaways tonight. And uh, all you got to do is leave a comment. And Larry, what are those giveaways this evening? They are. We're going to kick things off with a pair of Prime Elevation speakers, then a PB1000 Pro subwoofer. And then to wrap it all up, we have an SB2000 Pro subwoofer as well. So uh, we've got some great giveaways for you guys tonight. And I should say, when I was at Audio Advice Live uh, in Raleigh a couple weeks ago, I met three giveaway winners who had come to the show. Two of them had actually won on the broadcast prior to that show starting. So literally they won a prize the night before uh, and it was great. I think uh, one was the awesome. donut man uh, who I know is uh, a regular. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, you know, we, we just appreciate everyone coming to these live events and, uh, and letting us know that they tune in. It's just, uh, it's why is he the donut fun. man? Did he bring you donuts or what? <laughs> He did not, but he owns about four subwoofers, so uh, he can he can name himself whatever he wants, and I'm cool nice. with that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think we've we've all had a, a little bit of ch of a chance to kind of be tuning into some new things, and uh, we do have a, a really special guest tonight. He's a second time viewer, so before we get into our content recommendations, what we've been listening to, uh, Matt Yoakum will be joining us in a little bit. He's a sound engineer. He's worked on all sorts of movies, TV, podcasts. So we're looking forward to geeking out and getting deep into the world of sound engineering and making immersive audio. So uh, very much looking forward to that. But Gary, I know you're chomping at the bit to talk about what you've been listening to recently and where you've been. So we'll start with you uh, as far as uh, that goes. Well, my legitimate excuse is uh, my uh, sons who are 25 and, and 23, John and Chris, uh, August the 3rd was Chris's 23rd birthday. Um, they reached out to me and they're like, dad, Lollapalooza has really good headliners this year. We should go for Chris's birthday. Um, and, and anybody knows about Lollapalooza, it's a massive, massive festival. They have eight stages uh, in Grant Park in Chicago. Um, I, I think it's something like 125,000 people a day go, which means it's the biggest festival in North America. 
Um, and the headliners were Billy Eilish, Kendrick Lamar, who my, my sons adore, and I actually adore him as well. And um, uh, the final act on the final night, after people ha have been going, you know, for four days, seeing shows from one o'clock until ten o'clock every day, was Red Hot Chili Peppers. So they really had to bring it, and they really did bring it. It was just a, a magnificent performance, and and uh, m uh, of the three of us, my two sons and I agreed it was the, probably the best. Con and I've seen a lot of concerts, folks. The best concert I've ever seen. It was wonderful, and um, you know, from a recorded music. Uh, place. I don't remember if I said this on our last show, but I have been discovering, Nick, someone who you brought to my attention, um, Bring Me the Horizon, which has kind of started out as kind of a, I'm not sure what to call them, sort of a, they sounded a lot like Linkin Park sort of metal, a little more, maybe a little more melodic than Linkin Park. And, but now they have moved into a much broader footprint, and I think they're just great. Um, and they are actually SBS enthusiasts. Two of them have SBS products that they love. So it was really um, great discovering their recorded music. And I am going nice. to recommend that um, wholeheartedly to the SBS community. I do have to ask, any new bands that you discovered while at Lollapalooza, new music that you got into just from being there? If I say this, you guys are going to, if you know who this is, you're going to be like, what an idiot you are. But I really enjoyed this guy young gravy that you guys all hung out with in las vegas i enjoyed the heck out of him he is hilarious um and so that was one and then uh carol g was one of the headliners on a night where we didn't really have any plans and, sh and, and that was great so that that's it wow young gravy with his uh second plug on on the happy hour here I, i'm yes. sure we're he's hilarious he's yeah. absolutely hilarious my my sons are like dad that that music is too immature even for us, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry. I know it's been brutally hot there, and you had some live music you were trying to go to. What uh, what have you been into? Yeah, we've been staying inside. Um, but uh, I took this week off. I took a vacation this week because we had a bunch of concerts to go to, and it was so intensely hot that we uh, sold those tickets. But uh, we are going to go next week and see Counting Crows and Dashboard Confessional because it's kind of indoors. And Metallica is here tomorrow, so I might go. I'm debating and watching tickets, or watching tickets. But uh, I did get to see Indiana Jones finally, uh, I guess like two weeks ago, and I saw Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer last week when I was in Chicago. And I took my kids to see Ninja Turtles. Saw that in Dolby Cinema that weekend it came out, which was uh, maybe the best turtle movie ever. And I watched Fast X, and it was so stupid. Um, but we will absolutely be playing it at some of our events. So, is that really uh, the 10th in the franchise? Yeah, man. They, Jason Momoa is a cartoon character. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, how did you like uh, uh, Oppenheimer? I enjoyed it. It was, uh, but I like everything Christopher Nolan does. So, uh, I so with the, the Ninja Turtles, are we looking at another iconic base demo scene or will it still not top the uh, original? I don't know, man, but it had one of the most killer soundtracks ever. Uh, it's all 90s, you know, like hip hop, so oh, okay. uh, it's pretty awesome. I like that. Cool, Ed. How about yourself? My son saw Oppenheimer and he said it was great, and I, I, I really admired that he went and saw a, a period movie like that. He feels a little bit more connected to the to the war effort and and the global politics at the time and the science behind um, developing nuclear weapons. So it was kind of Kind of cool. I'd like to see it myself. Um, uh, we're still in knee deep in season three of Jack Ryan, uh, catching up with me and my significant other. And I'm looking forward to season four, which uh, should probably be at least midway done at this point. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, well, I uh, I uh, tuned into one of the movies that our guest tonight actually did a lot of the sound engineering for. It's a, it's a movie called Devotion. It's sort of half war movie, half love story. Watched it with my wife. We both loved it. Uh, I'll save some of my feedback for uh, when we bring him on. Um, Hijack, a new, uh, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's a series on Apple TV. Uh, having a lot of fun with that. Uh, you know, basically it's sort of about a plane that gets hijacked. But what I found to be really interesting about that, we fly quite a bit is the ability of a surround sound system to just capture that 
feeling of being on a plane with like the announcements coming from in front of you, a guy coughing behind you, you know, a baby wailing to the side of you. It just sort of, you know, while it's not your prototypical like surround sound demo, I was very much like, I'm about to take off here. And it, it was kind of a cool way to do that. Nothing, well, a couple of crazy things have happened, but uh, we're only two episodes in, uh, so we're enjoying that. Um, and then talking about immature music, um, I was listening to the radio in my car with my six-year-old and the butthole surfers came on. And yeah, as soon as he learned the name of the butthole surfers, he was like obsessed with wanting to hear every song they've ever played. So we've been listening to a lot of uh, music from the 90s, including the butthole surfers, which I actually so, forgot how much I liked them. Yeah, I mean, you got to have fun with their name too, but their music videos were pretty iconic. And I downloaded Hijack too, but I tend to only watch stuff uh, when I travel and I'm on an airplane. And you can't really watch something like that when you're flying. No, you, that, that's one that's maybe a little off limits there, but uh, it's it's a yeah. lot of fun. You should definitely check it out. Um, so we do have some upcoming events that uh, we're uh, currently putting some pages together for, but I figure we get them on everyone's radar because we got three different cities we're going to be hitting in October. Uh, first will be October 5th. We're going to Worldwide Stereo in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania. Uh, 6 to 8 p.m. So uh, one of our, our best retailers in the country there will be doing one of our speakers and subwoofers unleashed events. And then and that's, a, that's a, I think anyone around there knows this, but that's a very close in Philadelphia suburb. So very, yeah. very, if you're anywhere in the mid Atlantic, it's not too hard to get to. Very easy to get to. And then for the first time in SVS history, the following week, we're going to have two events back to back in different time zones which is kind of crazy, but uh, you know what? We love doing these so much that we want to bring that energy. And so we'll be at Nebraska Furniture Mart in Omaha, Nebraska on October 10th. And then listen up in Denver, Colorado on October 11th. So that might be two happy hour streams in a row as well. Uh, so that'll be a great week for, uh, for you folks who love to tune in and lots of giveaways, lots of fun. And two of the iconic stores that you can visit for electronics and just home goods in general in the United States. We're very excited about those. Nick, are you reading your texts? You want to read your texts? <laughs> not reading my texts. Uh, should I be? Yes. Okay. Well, they're not coming through as clearly as they should. Um, all right. Uh, noted. So uh, I did want to bring up one question before we dive into the, uh, the guest interview. Uh, and I'm actually, if you look in my room here, you can see behind me, I have uh, some open windows. And, and Ed, maybe you can help me with this one. I'm looking to get some kind of window treatments, whether they're blinds or curtains. So for sound dampening, what is the thing you should look for if you're getting some kind of window treatments to kind of either deaden the room or create an effect that's really going to improve the acoustics of a space? Heavier curtains are better for dampening high frequency energy. Um, the blinds that can be like partially open and have slats in them are better for diffusion. Um, they, they don't really absorb a lot of energy, but they will scatter mids and highs. So it really depends on what you're looking to achieve from that particular part of the room. All right. Well, well, definitely good. either one is way better than bare glass. Bare glass is brutal in terms of high frequency reflections into the room. All right. And then if I'm starting with acoustic treatments, I mean, I, you know, you can basically reach out to an acoustic treatment company, but like, where should I start as far as bass traps and, and absorption panels? Like, what is the strategy for understanding how many you need and, and where you should go with that? The big three are acoustic panels and uh, diffusers and bass traps. The acoustic panel should go at what we call your primary or first reflection points. And those are the main services where there would be a bounce off the ceiling or a bounce off the walls before it hits the listener. Those need to be treated for uh, the speakers in the room. And uh, diffusers should be placed strategically throughout the room, like I said, to sort of scatter the mids and highs. And then bass traps should go in the corners because that's where bass tends to accumulate the most. And the bass traps essentially reduce the amount of reflected energy into the room, which in turn reduces the uh, uh, magnitude of the standing waves. And it's less problematic in terms of uh, peaks and nulls. Well, Ed, we're going to be having uh, more conversations about this because I have both on the way as of uh, tomorrow when I'm going to be ordering them. So uh, I'm looking forward to kind of getting rid of some of that echo effect that I've got. It's It's been sort of the last 
standing uh, portion of what I need to do to get my theater where it should be. And uh, I, you're going to be shocked. I, I promise you, you will be shocked if you do the treatments properly and install them in the right spots. It will transform your room. You won't even recognize it afterwards. It, it's that much better. And then you get to recalibrate. Yep. Reruns. I, I was, it's funny you said that, Larry. I was going to say, always run the recalibration if you do anything uh, that changes the sonic characteristics of the room. Yeah, and somebody's asking, if would it help if uh, people in the room were wearing heavy coats? I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> it's actually, you make that joke, Probably but that's a not bit. a joke. That's actually, um, the more people in the room, the better, uh, the, the fewer reflections. So that, that it's... If you, I mean, you know this, Larry, because when we do our uh, our events, the room sounds one way, and we're talking yeah. about reflections and things, and we know when there's a couple hundred people in that same room oh, that sure. it's going to sound. The reflections are all going to go away. All right. Very well, true. are you ready to bring on the special guest? Because I've been very so. shopping at I, the bit. He's to, a great uh, guest. I think we get should him get him on here for sure. Uh, I want to welcome for the second time to the SVS Audio File Happy Hour. He's a sound engineer based in California who's worked on oh all sorts of different kinds of projects from movies and TV to podcasts, commercials, music videos. Like if it has audio, I feel like Matt, you've done it. Uh, so welcome to Matt <laughs> Yoakum. Uh, he's a he's a veteran of the industry and and just a great guy in general. How you doing tonight, Matt? Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. How are you guys doing? Good to see you back, man. Good to We're see you. We're doing Matt. excellent. And uh, for having you know, me I, back. I did want to ask, you know, before we get into some of the questions, just uh, any recommendations you have for programs or music that you've been listening to, uh, things that might, people may or may not have heard about, um, you know, for, for good demos and just in general. Um, I'm not sure about maybe things people don't know about, but uh, I also saw Oppenheimer and 70 Mill at the IMAX here at uh, Universal Studios in. Here in LA, uh, I thought it sounded phenomenal. Uh, it was definitely one of the more elegant mixes from uh, Nolan. Um, very artistic, just so much art uh, throughout that entire film. And then last night, we actually went and saw. My wife is a huge horror movie fan, so we went and saw this movie called Talk to Me, which is the one where like they grab the hand. I thought it also sounded phenomenal. It was a really fun sound job and a like a as far as horror movies go, one of the more original and like unique IPs that I've seen. So awesome. uh, we had a lot of fun watching that last night. All right. Good recommendation there. And that, I mean, that brings me into it. I wouldn't call this series horror, but we've talked a lot about The Last of Us. It was all of one of our favorite shows and it got a yeah. lot of critical acclaim, I think uh, Emmy nominated. Um, and I'm just curious what your experience was like working uh, on that show and, and just, you know, why do you think it was nominated for all the awards and, and got the acclaim that it did? Uh, I, I mean, I think, so first of all, like I, I, lo I loved working on the show. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was stressful for sure because uh, TV deadlines tend to be much shorter than features. Uh, and the funny thing is like those episodes were so long. Uh, you know, it was, the first episode was like an hour and a half and yep. a bunch of the episodes averaged between like an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. So that's like practically a feature film per episode. Um, and we, we get a fraction of the time to get through TV that you do to get through uh, feature films. But it was, it was just so much fun. I was brought on by a friend of mine named Chris Terhoon to like help out and help uh, lend support. And uh, it was just a really fun challenge to work in a world where, like, everything is sort of, you know, dilapidated and, and degraded over the course of time. And it was just, it was just a lot of fun to, to bring so much, like, texture and character to everything. Like, nothing could just be a normal version of, of anything. You couldn't have just, like, a normal door or a normal car. Like, everything had to have this sense of being, like, degraded and worn out because everything's been held together with paper clips and bubble gum for the past 20 years since the you know the the infected uh you know began to take over so, so how does that was, actually manifest fun. itself when you're you know doing your work are you pulling recordings of you know just rusty beaten up cars and and you know what what's the process there yeah so so my job uh in any case whether it's you know a tv show like the last of us or um or a movie my job is to essentially fill out the world with sound in accordance with what the narrative is calling for so um 
Oh, I guess like a, a major misconception that people have is, and I think I said this on the last show, but I'll just repeat it really quickly is, you know, people watch a movie and they see airplanes or zombies or, you know, cars driving by or just something as mundane as like a fireplace in the background. And people hear those sounds and just assume like that's, it just is what it is. Like that's how it was recorded. And that, you know, it must've been recorded on set that way. But like the only thing that, they're concerned about recording when they're on set is dialogue between characters and literally nothing else. Like everything else is actually designed to be as quiet as possible on set so that we have noise free character dialogue, which means the entire world needs to be rebuilt after the fact. So, you know, if characters are walking down a street and there's, you know, sirens in the background or a horn over there or a car drives by over here or birds are tweeting or what have you, like all of it is, you know, created afterwards in post. So that's my job is to essentially source sounds from a collection. I have a pretty vast collection of sound effects uh, that I've collected over the years. Some recording myself. There's also commercial libraries that are available for purchase and like large collections that people can buy. Um, and so those are the tools that we use. And then we essentially bring those into our program, put it all in sync and then make loads of other creative That's decisions awesome. in the process. So that actually leads me to my next question, which uh, I think is sort of an offshoot of that. Um, you know, watching Devotion, the the war movie uh, the other night, there's this scene towards the end that's just sort of like this cacophony of warfare. Um, and as the person creating the sound, like how do you piece all that together to cover, to make something that's like cohesive and realistic and, and accurately capture sort of the chaos and agony of combat? Like if they're just recording the dialogue, like, you're seeing all these things in front of you as the engineer. Like, what is that process like where, you know, you have to place all these different um, sounds and effects? Yeah. So the general approach typically is like cover literally everything. Like we start by, you know, it's essentially, you know, if we see it on the screen, it, it sort of needs to have a sound to it. I mean, that, that's, this is, this is a reductive sort of version of this process, but essentially uh, if we see it, uh, then we need to hear it, at least in the editorial process. So there's essentially two distinct phases of post sound. The first being what we call editorial or sound editing or sound design. Uh, and that's what I was talking about just a moment ago, where we actually are placing the sounds in the film. So that's mm -hmm. covering everything. So if we're in an airplane, I need to hear the engine. I need to hear the propeller. I need to hear the wind outside. I need to hear the rattling of the inside of the cockpit. I need to hear the movement of the pilot in the cockpit. I need to hear the bombs outside. I need to hear the bullet whiz bys. I need to hear the other airplanes. So like <laughs> everything that's in the scene like needs to be built out. Uh, and then the mixing part of the process, which comes later, is essentially editorial is additive and mixing is mostly subtractive. So like the, the mix process is then taking that giant you know, essential, essentially like a marble slab and then chiseling away to get to all the important details. The easiest way to think about this is kind of like sound is sort of, you can imagine it sort of like if, 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 if there's 15 actors on a stage, right, and all the characters are performing, there's like one guy with a spotlight whose job it is to like track you know, whoever's like the main focus of the scene at any given time. And then that's kind of like what the mix process is. Like I may have provided all of those sounds that I was talking about, but we may only need to hear a few of those in any given moment. Like what's the focus? Like where do I want to drive the listener's ear to? Like what's the most important thing either for emotional impact or for practical reasons? Uh, so it's it's this process of like reducing and carving out what needs to be heard at any given time. So for a scene like that, could that take exponentially longer than, you know, other parts of the movie, which are mainly dialogue driven just because of how much is going into it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I mean, sort of by like virtue of sheer quantity of sounds that need to be cut, it can take longer. And there's certainly like more to do in terms of that shaping that I was talking about. It's more complicated, but um, it's funny though. It, it's not necessarily like harder to do the big bombastic scenes. And, and I tell a lot of people like 
the hardest scenes are actually typically the really quiet ones because uh, when you're in a quiet scene, you know, so much is like focused and honed in on that character's dialogue that like, if that dialogue wasn't pristinely recorded, it can tend to stick out like a sore thumb. And mm. when you're in a really quiet scene, like all the little tiny nuances matter. Like I'm not worried about little tiny nuances when there's like you know, explosions going on. I'm, it's, you know, it's there's when you're in a really quiet, intimate yeah. scene, you don't have anything to hide behind. So those tend to be the more like meticulously crafted moments. So I, I, I totally experienced that, that the quiet moments when they're done right, they draw you in. And now this is when I start to feel like I'm in there with what's really, with, I'm there with what's happening on screen. And I totally get that. And when, and when there's those, as you say, bombastic moments, they totally work, but it's not necessarily with a lot of subtlety. They're, they're smashing you over the head in many cases. Yeah, so, absolutely. Before we get to the next question, we do have a giveaway. And our first giveaway of the evening, as Larry alluded to, is a pair of our Prime Elevation speakers. And our winner of those speakers is Tommy Austin. Congratulations, Tommy. We are entering the vote and make sure we get those shipped out. Uh, so you mentioned your wife's a big horror buff. I know you worked on the movie The Pope's Exorcist. And I'm just curious, like, it's got to be fun mixing sound for, for horror movies and, like, trying to come up with ways to, like, create jump scares or, or I don't know. I mean, just tell me about if that's different or, or, you know, what sort of you get out of a process where, you know, it's a different genre like horror versus something that maybe is more like, you know, subdued. Yeah. I mean, like one of my favorite things actually about working in movies and different TV shows is getting to work in such a wide variety of genre. Like I've been really lucky. There, there's some people who like have a career where they sort of become experts in one genre and like, that's what they do. And that's great but I love that I've had the opportunity to have like a breadth of experience in different genres um, because each one of them calls for like a sort of a different set of creative muscles to be flexed, if you will. Mm. Like it's just a different approach. Animation is very different from horror, which is very different from sci-fi, which is very different from like a historical period piece. Like they're all just like a different part of your brain and like part of your, different parts of your library that you have to exercise and like design chops that you have to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, something like the Pope's Exorcist is particularly uh, fun to work on for a while because it's like, for those of you who have seen it, it's just such a bombastic sound job. Like there's just a bunch of really big, crazy moments and insane like basically every horror trope in any movies like <laughs> thrown nice. into this movie. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's I'm going to scare crazy, the wife but, later. Yeah. But, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, you know, we sort of the direction, uh, from Julius, uh, on that, the director is, it was essentially just go as big as you can all the time. Like right. just, just make it fun and huge and massive. And then, you know, like the supervisor on that one, uh, was this great guy that I love working with Robbie Stambler and, um, you know, we would turn something in and he'd be like, yeah, we just made like the biggest thing ever. And the director would come back and be like, cool. How can we like amp that up? Like, <laughs> yeah, like it's already placing been. literal explosions under things that are not explosions on screen to just make them feel like big and impactful. But it's a lot of fun. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, do you have a favorite horror movie as far as sound goes in, in terms of what it can do to really scare the hell out of you? Uh, that's a great question favorite horror movie sound um i know larry likes uh annabelle's creation there's one yeah. scene within that specifically have, that we've demoed a couple a couple of my uh, a couple of my friends uh were responsible for the sound on a quiet place which has got to be a great one, that's yeah. the one that it, comes it, to my mind that that it's a, one it's is, about sound it's like it's kind of the perfect canvas but they did it perfectly yeah, th those are my friends, uh, Justin Davy and Brandon Jones. Uh, those guys are just incredibly talented guys, and uh, that soundtrack sounded phenomenal. See, yeah. so you alluded to getting, uh, you know, really involved with a lot of different genres, and and one of those uh, that you actually won an award for uh, was podcasts, and you know, the, it was specifically left right game, and, and I haven't mm -hmm. heard it, but I'm just curious, you know, what's the mentality there mixing for a podcast since it is a purely audio medium? Like, what what do you need to do? that maybe is a little different or, or what's your methodology? 
Yeah, so uh, the interesting thing when I was approached to do these podcasts um, was that the the concept from the outset with this company called Qcode was, and they, they were kind of the first ones to really do this in a big way, um, was they wanted to essentially create uh, like a radio play, but that was fully fleshed out sonically. So it was essentially like a movie that you would listen to without any visuals. Uh, the interesting thing also is that Dolby specifically came in to partner uh, with this project on, from the outset. And I ended up working with them and then later becoming a consultant for Dolby uh, because they wanted to develop their Atmos system uh, into essentially a contained format that was binaural for headphones. And so with the left right game, I actually don't necessarily recommend listening to it like on a stereo system. Uh, a lot of people listen to it in their car, but it was actually rendered binaurally. So the most effective way to uh, listen to the left right game is actually on headphones because you have the Atmos mix and everything moving around you. But it's a really fun kind of heady sci fi movie um, or podcast. Sorry. Sounds just like a movie. And uh, it's just a really fun, engaging storyline. So the approach was pretty similar to any other product I would do. I mean, this was unique in terms of workflow because there's sort of a double-edged sword of not having any visuals. Like, like we learned pretty quickly throughout the process that it's both fun to not have visuals because I'm not necessarily having my hands tied to anything. And so I can kind of open up that creative box and kind of explore all these different avenues. But on the flip side, somebody who's not read the script and is listening to this for the first time has to be able to listen to it and uh, actually understand what's going on. So it was uh, pretty interesting to try to straddle that line uh, of like making it fun and big and kind of crazy, but also making sure that it was contained enough that people weren't going to get just confused and lost in the cacophony. So that's awesome. Yeah. I just looked it up right on my phone just now as you're saying it and downloaded it. So it's a. Uh... So I can listen to it later. Yeah, they, Matt, was, Matt, I have a question about. Go for it. But 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 it's not about sound. I hope it's okay. I'm uh, I've here. I am in L.A. and I'm seeing it's a to big topic in the local news. The uh, fallout from the the two strikes, and I'm and I'm I'm kind of wondering if you have anything you want to share about that, either if, if, if from a personal perspective or people that you know. And then, do you have any insights for us on on uh, when that might end? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any insights. I, I do know that um, the WGA is currently back in negotiations with the studios. Um, there's a ton of opinions flying around out there. You know, everybody's sort of contributing their own sort of thoughts on what's going on. Um, it's it, it essentially just boils down to uh, you know part, part of part of the reason that we have unions. Like I'm, I'm a part of a of a sound union out here um which is actually under a larger umbrella of post workers um is is to essentially just make sure that like like the entertainment industry can be pretty demanding and brutal and a lot of times the schedules are like you know demanding in order to get some of this content made and there's no shortage of content being made right like there's so many streaming platforms now and just so much being made uh that Sometimes it can be a little bit of a race to the bottom, like, you know, somebody manages to pull something off, you know, like, let's say we normally had a month to, like, capture this idea for, let's just say a one hour episode of TV or something. Maybe that's even generous. Let's say it's two weeks. But then the studio comes and says, like, we want it in one week. And you're like, <laughs> well, you don't really have an option other than to get that done so then you get that done you like bust your butt trying to get that done in a week and then you think oh well thank god you know i've done it and now we'll go back to having crazy you know like normal schedules but then the studio sees that you did it in a week and they go well you just did it in a week so like let's just do that let's just keep doing that like it was possible mm -hmm. and so it, it's this sort of like race to the bottom in terms of budgets and schedules but that's part of the that's part of the job of the union is to like protect to make sure that we're not being uh, abused on hours, that we're being paid, compensated properly, that we have benefits. Because um, as you can imagine, as a freelancer, I work at many different studios. It just depends on the project, you know, whether it's Sony or Fox or Disney or Warner Brothers, like, you know, I'm all over the place. 
And so to try to like have benefits from all of these different places at different times and be juggling would be really difficult. So the function of the unions is to protect the workers. And that's what's going on right now. Like both the, the WGA, the Writers Guild and the actor, the Screen Actors Guild um, have got, you know, demands that they believe are reasonable to keep their people you know, happy and working and you know, making this content, which makes the studios a ton of money. And the studios are fighting back against that. And there's, there's a whole bunch of information that you can look up about that stuff. But it, that's well, kind of yeah. The- we don't need to go there. Yeah. No, but think, no. Yeah, but it is cool. interesting the way you said that, and I thought it, I think it was great. And and you know, it's easy to forget if you're in a business that your your business is supporting essentially an art form, and the artists are the energy. And you, and you're you're essentially you are an artist uh, uh, in what you do. And uh, the artists are creating the real value in that in that uh, in that business, and so it's easy to forget that if you if you actually are the person running the business. And so it's I think it's a good good uh, reminder. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, like the corporations, they're like a CEO's job is to make profit, and our job on the content side is to make art, like you said. And so. Yeah. Sometimes those two directions don't necessarily align, uh, but you know we do what we can. I, I'm living the dream. I'm just grateful every day that I get to do this. So uh, you know I, I get to make a living like playing around in a room with great speakers. Like, and, I can and tell you, the, a lot like, of the commenters are like, "Oh, this sounds like my dream job." And, and let's not let, let's be honest here, Matt. You did have uh, quite a bit of education that went into uh, getting to where you are. So it wasn't like this was something that just you know you stumbled upon. Uh, but it, it does sound like a lot of fun. Um, and, and to you know to follow up on that, uh, I know you own an SB four thousand subwoofer. So I'm curious. You know, there's some questions about the room and, and sort of your system behind you. Uh, Two part question: How does the SB four thousand play into you know your mixing and mastering process and the engineering that you do? Uh, and then what's different about the setup you have there in your home studio versus maybe what's in a, a typical home theater? Um, you know, are your objectives different when you're putting it together? Uh, just what yeah. can you tell us about your your actual system? Totally. So. Uh... I love my SB4000, and I'm not just saying that because, uh, like, no, nobody's, you know, pressuring me to say this, but... Uh, <laughs> not but, on uh, camera, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I, I truly love the sub. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, uh, especially to demo when, you know, friends come over and want to hear the room. And just crank it up a little bit and have some fun. But, uh, no, so the goal... You know, part of the reason I, I chose the SVS sub was because, you know, one of the things that you guys espouse is, is the accuracy. And that really is just the name of the game. Whether you're mixing music or you're working on film or TV or doing anything sound related, you always want to have an environment that you can trust. Like, I want to make sure that when I'm working on something in this room, that if I go somewhere else, that it's going to sound somewhat familiar to what I was hearing in my room here it's always going to be different no matter what space I move to. But like, you know, one of the most satisfying things is, you know, I'm working in a literal, a literal box. Like this is a 10 by 10 room, which is just about the worst shape and dimensions you can have (laughs) for a workspace like mine, but it's filled with uh, bass traps and acoustic treatment. Like I heard Ed talking about earlier. A lot of people I've heard people ask uh, before about these behind me. These are not speakers. These are, probably like five inch thick bass trap panels behind me. This this is all acoustic absorption and I've just placed my tchotchkes above for display, but uh, this is all acoustic absorption. I've got a ton of acoustic absorption in front of me as well as in the corners. I've got floor to ceiling uh, corner bass traps. These are all made by a company called GIK in Atlanta. They're made by hand and they're really, really great. Um, And so, you know, you asked about the difference between setting up a studio versus a home system. Like I said, you know, my goal in here is to be fairly clinical. Like I need, I don't want my room to sound good. I want it to sound accurate. Like I don't need my room to sound pleasant. I need it to tell me if things aren't pleasant. I need to know if something's harsh or sticking out or if something's muddy and rumbly, which is where the sub comes in. Like I need to be able to feed sound in and to get accurate feedback so that when I go from my little 10 by 10 room to, you know, one of the world's biggest dub stages, you know, down in Culver city at Sony, it needs to translate and it needs to rock and sound just as good in a giant theater as it does 
here in my little 10 by 10 room. So accuracy is the name of the game for me. Uh, that's why I love the sub. Um, between the acoustic absorption, uh, the tuning that I've done in the room, and then the accuracy that the sub and my speakers bring, uh, it's just a pretty, it's a pretty fantastic system. So, so a lot of people will like run their subs ones. hot, you know, because they want a little extra emphasis in the low end. Like that is off limits. You need it to be clinically accurate. I need it to be accurate, not fun. The home yeah. theater system out, yeah. out, you know, you know, when you're when you're at home or you're in a living room or like, you know, whatever. If you're setting up a system to have fun, that's awesome. Uh, and you know, the thing is, like, because I work in a clinical environment, my goal is to make it sound fun in a clinical environment. Like, like if I'm doing my yeah. job, things have weight and punch and like are loud but are not hurting. Like, my goal is always to like have it if i can make it sound fun in here it'll sound fun on any other system is the mm. goal yeah uh, so, and they can make the adjustments to kind of dial it up as they see fit you know boost totally. different channels add, add some more bass and uh you know but you give them that sort of blank canvas to, to really make those fun adjustments i guess you could say absolutely so let me do a giveaway oh do you got a question gary oh you're muted gary you gotta unmute i think i can unmute you uh <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta unmute yourself. That's a serious moment. There you no, go. because uh, because I was getting feedback that my microphone was bumping against my shirt because I'm in this hotel room. But I, I just do want to give Matt a compliment that you know you have this unique ability to make me want to listen to content differently and listen for some of the things you're pointing out. And it really does. I mean, even from what I do, because I do actually listen in voice speakers. Um, from what I do, you're like giving me things to think about and look for. So I'm very thankful. And I, I think the SDS community is going to hear their content, whatever it is, whether it's streaming video or, or movies, they're going to hear it differently. Thanks to these insights. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much, Gary. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm ha I, I love, to I could talk about this stuff for hours. I know we've <laughs> right. got a short show here, but uh, right. you know, whatever questions y'all have, I love talking about it. So feel free to ask. All right. Well, next giveaway we have, uh, and we're going to follow up with one or two more questions before we get to our lightning round, but uh, we have a PB 1000 pro subwoofer up for giveaway and our winner of that is mr daniel gibbons daniel gibbons congrats you got a sweet ported sub awesome. coming your way congratulations uh, i mean matt i feel like you're on the cutting edge of all this sound engineering and everything that's happening um you know two parts what do you view as the sort of future of cinematic sound or just sound in general across all the different genres and then any projects you want to tie that into things you might be working on that uh might sort of exemplify what the future holds in store for us yeah, sure. So in terms of the future of sound, there's there's sort of two sides to it. So uh, one is that, um, you know, with Dolby Atmos becoming more and more prevalent, I mean, it's been around for a, quite a while now, like longer than people realize, but it takes it's taken so much time to become like a ubiquitous uh, thing in the market. It takes, you know, understandably, it takes the like both commercial theaters and home theaters, you know, people who are building their systems, take, it takes quite a bit of effort to install, you know, ceiling speakers, you've got to have speakers down the sides, and it's like, you know, recalibrating everything to be able to sort of play back accurately. Um, and, you know, thankfully, that's sort of becoming more and more accessible. Like, you know, at this point, uh, I'm, I'm always a, a, uh, an advocate for, you know, floor standing speakers and having sort of a nice robust speaker system. But if you're living in an apartment or, you know, you can't necessarily afford to dish out several grand for, you know, a home theater system, it is becoming possible to, you know, grab a sound bar from various companies that are at most enabled and to, you know, use that. And if that's your starting point, then great. I mean, that's better than, playing out of stereo TV speakers. So it's cool that that technology is becoming more and more accessible for consumers. Um, and then, you know, on the other side of things, like I, I would uh, sort of do like a shameless plug for the industry to your audience members and say, like, please keep go, please keep going to movie theaters and like watch movies in the theaters um you know despite all the stuff that's going on with the studios right now and and you know sort of the the different sides of of that debate uh you know ultimately like we're the people that are being affected by this stuff there's so much talk of like theaters not necessarily being a viable business model anymore and like 
different theater chains and, and locations shutting down due to inactivity. So, um, you know, that saddens me because I, I love the theatrical experience. Like, you know, like I said, I, like I work on movies all day, every day. And last night we went to go watch a movie in the theater and we went to go see Oppenheimer in theater. And we went to see Barbie in theater because it's like a communal area and it's like the intended format for this so like you know there's a joke in the industry of like you know how nolan intended and somebody will make a meme of like somebody <laughs> watching dunkirk on their apple watch or something like as <laughs> nolan intended, which is great but yeah, but truly not like not it's, it's, there's just no other experience like seeing it in the movie theater that's it's the large format totally that it's been intended yeah. for so yeah you know, we're gonna go see to watch Beatle this home, weekend but, yeah but yeah, I, you know, and there was an industry shift in the model back when COVID started happening, where they were doing all these simultaneous releases, which, you know, there's a whole debate about that as well. It sort of saddens me. Like, I, I still always make the effort to go to the theater. So if you guys can afford to go to the movie theater, uh, that's that's what we do. So uh, it's, you know, that'll keep that'll keep us churning out theatrical mixes. Yeah. You know, I, I, the way I view that is... Um, you know, you, you, you said this in a very interesting way because you brought in the idea of sound bars doing Dolby Atmos. And, and I think your point is a, a, a sound bar can be an enabler to wanting a better home theater. And, and, and the different ranges of home theaters up to the best can create an, an, a, you know, a desire to really experience the reference experience in a, in a theater, in a real theater environment, which we all, Larry is really good about that. We all, you know, go to, um, state-of-the-art theaters because we want to make sure we're on the right track with doing our best to recreate that in, in a living space there's a limit to what you can do but we want to do our best to yeah, yeah and that's sort of what i was talking about is like you know i, ha I have this uh <laughs> thanks for the the compliment down there <laughs> i i uh you know like you know i was talking about how my job is to translate from my 10 by 10 box into a theater experience. Like when we go to mix a movie, I don't think a lot of people realize like when we go to mix a movie, we go into what's called a dub stage, which is literally a theater. It's a theater sized room. It's, you know, it's designed to be like it's calibrated every day. It's just, again, it's designed to be accurate, not pleasant. So it's just a very clinical, but it's a large scale space. Like the physics of moving air you know, 30 feet from the screen to me is just different than a near field mix where I'm, I've got a speaker, you know, maybe four feet in front of me. So even though we're calibrated at the same SPL, I saw somebody ask, um, you know, theaters are calibrated to 85 dB SPL. And that's what I'm working at at home when I'm working on a theatrical mix. Uh, Cause I want it to translate. And you know, there's some misunderstanding from like a misconception where people think it's louder because you're in a smaller room. Like that's the point of the calibration is that it's the same, pressure level in a small room as it is in a large room so physically i'm receiving the same amount of energy mm -hmm. but the physical space like being in a large theater does change the way you feel and receive that information so yeah any, anyway that's a really long-winded uh, plug for please go watch movies in theaters <laughs> No, uh, a lot of it's the, the direct reflected sound ratio of the of the large venue versus a small venue and I've found getting back to room treatments, if the if your smaller room is treated properly, the direct reflected sound ratio is more similar to what you'd experience in a larger venue, and it and it sounds larger and more spacious than it is. But that that's really a lot of it. Um, it's really hard to fool the brain when you go into a big venue like an IMAX theater and your eyes are closed. You can tell you're in a big room, and you totally. can tell the speakers are farther away, even if the sound pressure level is the same. It's just a different experience. So and I, and totally I even get. personally, I even personally tend to prefer the uh, the Dolby Atmos theaters over the IMAX. Just personally, I went to go see Opera totally and IMAX yep. because of the scale. Yeah. But you know, the Dolby theaters have the the sort of THX baffle walls where the there's that extra layer of acoustic treatment on the front panel, so that secondary reflections are also absorbed, which affects sure. both high end, low end. And so I feel the Dolby rooms tend to be a little tighter, a little cleaner, a little more clinical and more accurate to the mix that I'm used to hearing on a stage. Whereas the, uh, you know, the uh, IMAX rooms are just more kind of fun and they've got that curve on both yeah, the low end and the high yeah. end that give you more, you know, just kind of like shakes you. It can also be like slightly more muddy, but, you know, but it's also a discrete mix. So like an IMAX mix is a dedicated mix separate from 
like a Dolby Atmos mix or a near field, uh, which I don't know if people realize that either. Like it's a separate pass. Uh, it's derivative of the Dolby mix, but there's a bunch of um, sort of tech changes that happen between an IMAX mix and an Atmos mix. Uh, and the way low end is handled specifically, actually, it's a crossover as, a, as opposed to a 0.1 where it's a discrete LFE channel, like IMAX, you get a bunch of low end for free. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to start like rolling off low end on a bunch of sounds that you didn't have to before because it goes straight to the subs. But uh, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm well, definitely with you on Dolby Cinema over IMAX. And there's some movies I've seen in both formats. And I, I yeah, IMAX is the larger screen, but the Dolby Cinema is definitely the way to go get the best cinematic experience. Well, we all it's have different, we all get different sonic cues to yeah. uh, to believe what's going on is really happening, and so it, it it's there's some of it is human perception. So I would I would definitely recommend people going to to both types of theaters and and you know kind of get your get your frame of reference straight because it's you know. It, you couldn't find a better time to go see a movie in a theater than right now. You don't have to fight to get a good seat. I mean, that, that, that's a, just a, a reality. And um, these state-of-the-art theaters, uh, I, I'm still going to say we can probably do a better job just in sheer sound in a, per, in a good room in a home. But, you, Matt, you might disagree. But, again, it all boils down to – and you certainly can't do as good of a job with picture – but it all boils down to creating a convincing experience. And a lot of that comes from psychological cues. We work at that a lot at SVS. Um, but I think the reference is, is as you say, in, in these theaters. Yeah. And I, I, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll tack on, I don't want to use too much, use up too much more of the time here. But, uh, you know, the last thing I'll say is like, I, I, and I, I'm, you know, I'm speaking to, you know, all of you guys who are, you know, speaker and subwoofer obsessed and like you guys are always chasing the best sound, which is great and admirable. And I do the same. Uh, but sort of, you know, at the end of the day, it, my job in my creative field is is essentially to distill down like people, people will often ask the question, you know, what happens if you go to a theater and the surround speaker is out? Or what if, what if the center channel is not tuned properly in somebody's home? Or what, you know, how, how do you consider all of that? And it's like, I, I can't really do my art considering the lowest common denominator. Like I can't predict all of the technical issues anybody will have in their own space or in a theater out in the middle of nowhere. Like there's nothing I can do about that. Like my job is to do things at the highest quality possible but at the end of the day what i care about is that somebody who's watching the content that i'm working on and what the director ultimately cares about because this is their vision that we're working towards ultimately is that your the sound is supporting the emotion and the story that you're supposed to be gathering from a scene so whether you're listening to a sound bar or you've got an incredible home you know, theater Atmos setup, or whether you're in IMAX theater or Dolby theater, like whatever, as long as you're getting the emotional impact and that the sound is driving you to connect with the characters on the screen, that's what I truly care about at the end of the day. I'm, I'm a nerd and I love all the tech stuff, but it's it's the art at the heart of it that uh, really matters to me. And if And if somebody walks away thinking something was fun or made them cry or made them laugh, and we had a role to play in that, then that's what's fulfilling on my end. So I think it. that's a great plate to love end it, it. Uh, Matt. I mean, you're the kind of nerd that we love. And uh, if you want to check <laughs> it out, you, gotta, you, you should go back and look at this, Matt, and see all these. You're getting showered with comments here. So <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid we're going to. We're going to be asking you to come back if you're if you're cool with it at some point. I, I, feel I love like, talking to you guys. I'm happy to come back. Well, we're, we're definitely going to invite you back. Check out Matt's I am. Uh, DB page. If you want to see his full portfolio of work, it's really impressive. And I'm sure there's more exciting projects on the horizon, uh, but you're just an, an awesome guest, fountain of knowledge, and uh, we appreciate you sharing some insights today. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I love talking to you guys, and thanks for nerding out with me. Yeah, yeah love the time. You, man. Thanks, Matt. All right. I, I, think that might I, I, most I have to say, sometimes I'm texting Nick, like, okay, it's I think it's time to move on from this guest. I, I never have that temptation with Matt. <laughs> well, we, we got a five minute lightning round. So uh, I got a question right away. Uh, Bioskar Posey asks, uh, he has two PB th PB2000 pros. He wants to know if he can add two SB2000 pros if he runs the PBs in sealed mode. Can he combine all four as long as the PBs are running sealed mode? I'm gonna say yes, yeah. absolutely. 
If you, you know, another move would be to to um, sell the um, PBs on uh, on the aftermarket or use our upgrade. We we will take upgrade of of you know even within almost any period and and help just to have four SBs. But four SBs is a lot of firepower. Yeah, you know? it is. So yeah. yeah All right. Next field, I think you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. From Dino Dodge. Uh, he asks, he wants us to discuss room nodes. How do you find them? How do you work around them? And I guess maybe you should define what a room node is. Uh, I'll start and then, well, Ed, you want to just do it? Maybe you're, you're, sure. you're you'll, yeah. you'll go deeper. In, I mean, it's, in it's really just the direct and reflected sound waves in the room um, colliding with each other. And sometimes they're going to reinforce and sometimes they're going to cancel. So let and... me let me just make that a little bit more English. Um, <laughs> sometimes the bass is going to go away in certain parts of the room at certain frequencies, and in other parts of the room, the bass is literally going to be double what it's supposed to be at certain frequencies, and that's because reflected and direct frequencies can either reinforce each other, as Ed said, or they can literally cancel each other out. And that creates problems, obviously, with the frequency response at the listening position. Uh, we we like to say we can deal with peaks a little more easily than we can with cancellation uh, nulls because peaks can be equalized, but nulls uh, are very difficult. In other words, you can reduce. Deal. It's not hard to reduce, but you can't keep shoving bass into a null because yes. it goes nowhere. Correct. So that's it, loud really everywhere important. else, but there. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's a really. You're, you're dumping point. energy into a, a into a black hole essentially in the room, um, so you're better off moving the subwoofer to a different location that uh, is it, it results in a, a smoother, better looking frequency response with less nulls at the listening position, less cancellation yeah. points. So another subwoofer question. And one of the and things this I do um, when we're in a new, I'm sorry, Nick, uh, no. I, and I know we're coming towards the end. One of the things I do when we're in a new room is Larry knows this and Larry does it too. We'll, Cause we do these, um, these uh, in-person shows. We'll walk around uh, as we listen and, and listen for the nulls and listen for the parts where we're being bombarded with too much bass. Um, and there's lots of ways to deal with it, but you know, in a normal room, I'm not, and this is where Ed and I might not totally agree. I'm not the biggest fan of bass traps, which I think are a massive expense and don't really, they, they improve the experience very subtly. Um, whereas just having two subwoofers, and that doesn't mean you have to double your budget. In fact, cut your budget in half for a single one and get two can eliminate 80% of the room nodes that you're experiencing just by having two instead of one. So I love this next question because it's weird and I just love weird questions. Uh, <laughs> T-Town Scott asks, and, and this affects a lot of people, so maybe it's not so weird, just nobody's ever thought about it. It's really hot here. Does heat affect sound? Planes don't take off in extreme heat. If it's super hot and humid, is can that actually impact the, the playback of your system? We're not engineer. We're not, you know, I, I mean, it, it's stumped. just more... A it's 111 degrees outside right now and it's way more uncomfortable sitting in here in my office than it normally is. Um, All right. So, but, so this might be an, I don't know. Is this the first, I don't know in the, the lightning round? Cause here's what I would say. We test the performance of our speakers and, and subwoofers in, in extreme environments because of the reason we do is to make sure that they can um, survive uh, in pretty much any situation. We do drop tests, we do voltage uh, tests, we do we, we, we run them really loud for long periods of time, we hit them with massive peaks, and we definitely experiment with different temperatures. And I can say that if the temperature is livable for a human being, it's fine for uh, high quality speakers and subwoofers. So it's I would say it's mostly a non-issue other than Larry's point that Hey, uncomfortable people. Maybe they're not thinking too much about sound. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question, and then we'll we'll wrap things here. Um, we have uh, somebody who's asking about the size of their room and whether it, you know, is there a ratio as far as uh, the room's nineteen by nineteen by nineteen, uh, music only. Is there a specific subwoofer that's right for that size of the room? And I guess the question is really, you know, what about the size of the room should factor into your decision in terms of which subwoofer you want to purchase? This is something we spend lots of time with 
people on. So Ed, Ed you can give them a general answer, but the, 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 the better answer is recall, give us a call and we'll help you figure that out. Yep. I would say if it's music only, you're looking at a sealed subwoofer and then uh, really what's the playback level? Is it moderate, moderately loud or, or really loud? And then we can size the subwoofer to that room and the playback level. You don't want to really have the subwoofer struggling at your preferred playback level in that size room. So the sub just needs to be sized to the room. But again, for, for music, sealed will give you the best experience and and i would say in a 19 by 19 uh room with a high ceiling maybe sp3000 sp4000 would be a, a great choice and would would certainly support a spirited playback level spirited i like that well I know we're we coming are... to the end of uh of this show but i just saw a comment somebody made saying that they uh they they were trying to do an upgrade and somehow they weren't able to and i would just say reach out anything like that reach out to me personally. You guys have my email address right on the website or reach out to Ed and we'll make it happen. There may have been a miscommunication of some kind, but yeah, we'll, we'll always take, we never leave. No SBS customer gets left behind. I promise. <laughs> we'll figure out a way. So on that note, before we get to our final giveaway, uh, we're tentatively scheduled to have our next audio file happy hour during Cedia, which is a sort of trade focus show it's not open to the public but we will be in denver uh that will be thursday september 7th we kind of have to see what the layout and the wi-fi situation there is in denver uh but tentatively uh headed for the show there and, and doing a happy hour on september 7th uh last giveaway of the evening is one of our most popular subwoofers the sb 2000 pro and the winner of that sealed sub is autumn thibodeau autumn thibodeau congrats Got yourself congratulations those stubble for coming away. So thanks again uh, immensely to Matt Yoakum. Check out his IMDB, see what he's been working on. Uh all of his future projects, you know, are gonna be awesome. There's some some content in there I need to catch up on as well. So uh look forward to having him back again. Thank you, gentlemen, as always. Appreciate your insights. And uh that's a wrap for today. Happy listening, everyone. See you guys.